Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the Internet Personality of the Best Hair, and welcome back to the March of the Clowns. Yeah, March. In any case, we'll be reviewing All Hallows' Eve, which isn't your traditional horror tale, but rather one of those fun little anthology horror movies where several short horror stories are presented with a small narrative thread connecting them all. That thread is that these tales are being shown on, you guessed it, All Hallows' Eve. Also known as Halloween, but that name's been taken. Also, these aren't just random horror stories thrown together for the sake of it, but they are made by writer-director Damien Leon, who is also the creator of Art of the Clown, which these all involve. Damien had previously made two short stories, both using Art the Clown, The Ninth Circle in 2008, and a 2011 short, Terrifier. Both of those tales are woven into this bone-chilling story of a babysitter haunted by the scariest damn video cassette she's ever seen. There's also another story that's kind of shoehorned in that really doesn't have anything to do with Art the Clown, but nevertheless, let's take a look at All Hallows' Eve and see if it all comes together. The movie opens, coincidentally enough, on All Hallows' Eve. Stop me if you've heard this one before, but the story focuses on a babysitter who is watching a family's children on Halloween. This would be Sarah, played by Katie McGuire, who is watching Tia and Timmy, played by Sidney Freehofer, and Cole Mathewson, respectively. They finish their candy run, but not quite done with all the festivities. What time is it? Oh, it's 10.15. Alright, seriously, pumpkin carving in 10 minutes. Wanna go get this over with? Yeah, not all that much time left to get that one done. I'm sure everyone's gonna love your spooky, spooky jack-o'-lanterns on November 1st. But what's this? One of Timmy's treats is a VHS cassette. He says he doesn't remember who put it in his bag, and it's unmarked. Let's watch it. Oh, absolutely not. Why? Because we got a fucking Blu-ray player. Where the hell are we gonna find a VCR at this time of night? Timmy insists they must watch it, because it may. In fact, be awesome! Sarah still refuses, so they vote. I vote we watch it too. Little traitor. Now you're on his side? Two against one. We win. Yeah, well, the Council of Babysitter has determined that the babysitter officially has won the vote, so stuff it! It can't be worse than the stuff we see on the internet every day. Jesus Christ, you're ten years old. What do you watch on the internet? However, after Timmy says if she lets them watch it, the kids will actually carve the pumpkin, Sarah relents, checking what exactly is on it first, of course. Thus begins our first tale of horror in this anthology. Anything? I don't see anything. Which YouTube has promptly blocked worldwide. God damn it! Eventually the horror show begins and the kids say, fuck it, and sit down to watch it. Fine, but if it gets out of control, I'm turning it off. Blood, guts, and graphic sex is fine, but if Jackie Chan shows up, I swear to God! Which begins the Ninth Circle. We are introduced to a lone woman heading home on Halloween, Casey, played by Kayla Leon. She's waiting for her train to show up, and in doing so, finds herself all alone. Spare for a certain clown. Art, played by Mike Gianelli. Who knows the greatest fear of anyone riding public transit is their fellow passengers being loud and obnoxious! And sit uncomfortably close, but it's all good. He offers her a flower. However, she doesn't much like the bugs inside, or being grabbed and drugged by the clown for that matter. Thus, she passes out, awakening later to find herself chained up in the dark subway tunnels. Where am I? What's happening? Would someone talk to me? Please stop screaming. You've just been kidnapped by a deranged clown, drugged and bound up with the rest of the prisoners in an abandoned subway tunnel. I mean, by horror movie standards, it's really not that scary yet. The other two women who have been here long enough to know that screaming doesn't help, anyway, would be Kristen, played by Marissa Wolf, and Sarah, played by Minna Taylor. Evidently, there was another girl earlier, but they got pulled down the tunnel by the chains one by one, and that's what happened to her. Casey can hardly believe the horrifying predicament she has found herself in. But don't worry, Sarah is there to calm her down in the face of unavoidable death. Or is it avoidable? Casey says they should go down the tunnel and investigate. We can't just stay here. Going into that tunnel is suicide. Oh, and staying here isn't? What did you know? You didn't see what happened to that girl. That's the magic of tell, don't show for you. Kristen describes the incident horrifyingly enough, but only to say their best bet is to just wait and hope for the best. 
Sarah, on the other hand, agrees with Casey. Kristen, we have to. We can't just wait here to see who's gonna be- <laughs> Well, I guess we won't have to remember that character's name from here on out. Calmly strolling down the dark tunnels littered with human bones, they find the end of their chains and some handy-dandy big fucking rocks to smash them with. Even better, the Toxic Avenger has come to save the day! No, no, no Toxie. The chains are around their necks. It's dark, hard to see, I know. It's even harder when you keep cutting away to the viewers. And it just leaves me wondering how horrifying the gore effects really were. Or goofy, leading to the cutaways actually being more effective. Our helpful hulking monster man cleaves Casey's chain, so she must run right into a handy dandy random stranger. Uh, there's a problem with this plan. <laughs> That's the thing. When you find yourself kidnapped and chained in the lair of culty monster psychopaths, chances are the first guy you run into isn't going to be a philanthropist. It's going to be a culty monster psychopath. And we suddenly teleport to the next scene. I'll just assume the vagrant no-face had another syringe of knockout juice or something. Casey has had better days now, finding herself strapped into the midst of a monster cult. They also have a tied up uh, pregnant woman there, played by Anna Mallory. But as you all remember, she swore she would turn this off if it got too extreme. And as anyone with any sense could easily tell... <laughs> ripping a fetus right out of a pregnant woman's belly is... Uh... That's nothing, isn't it? It turns out the sacrificial wound blood is just the opening beverage for motherfucking Satan, played by Eric Diaz, who then moves in for the main course, Casey. That was sick. Okay, that is enough for tonight. Hey, what are you doing? I'm turning it off. Oh, well, thank fuck. For a second there, I was worried I was going to have to break out the damn dolls. The kids are upset that Sarah has decided that something as tame as this is somehow too much for them. But props to her for looking out for my YouTube channel. Damn sense was to keep thinking this shit is real. And it's time for them to go to bed, which means it's time for them to fight for no apparent reason. What's going on up there? Sarah, Timmy saved my hair! It was an accident! The real mystery is how the hell these kids live in such a giant house, yet apparently only have one bathroom. So things are winding down. However, there are strange noises coming from the window. Little shit. Damn kids these days, don't their parents teach them nothing? You're only supposed to egg the house if they don't give you candy. Hence the or in trick or treat. Things are spooky enough inside though. Not only is the audio peculiarly loud, but the closet door is cracked open. Don't worry, Sarah is here to remind us that monsters aren't real. Except there's a problem with that angle. But he wasn't really a monster if you think about it. He was just a man in a costume. Someone like that could really exist. Ooh, your suspension of disbelief shall not be breaking on her watch. The clown's only on the video, right? So if you don't watch it, he can't hurt you. No, no, he just can't hurt you. Period. Unless we're going by the ring rules here. Not particularly reassuring, so Tia decides that she'll feel better if she stays with her asshole brother tonight. Also, after explaining the only way for the clown to hurt you is if you watch the video, Sarah decides it'd be fun to keep watching that video, which introduces our second story of the horror anthology, which I can't find a title for. Not in any trivia listings, not in the director's filmography, uh, this one's just kind of here. Introducing us to the tale of Caroline, played by Catherine Callahan. She just moved out of the city with her artist husband and is loving the seclusion and silence of being all alone in an unfamiliar house on a dark and spooky night. I'm gonna have to get my hands on one of his paintings before he gets too famous. Oh, I wish you'd buy his latest painting so I can get the hell out of this house. He needed his subjects to sit still for hours, so he just took his easel down to the goddamn Taco Bell drive-thru. 
Actually, its precise design is kept a secret for the time being, but Caroline says it's a very unsettling face that he doesn't even remember painting. Man, that sounds awesome, just being able to finish your work without realizing it. Nevertheless, that night, as we have established she is all alone, the power fluctuates and goes out. Then... A mysterious light crashes down outside. Which could be anything from a weather balloon to the origin story of Earthworm Jim. Can't live tweet about it, though, because whatever it was, it knocked out the power completely. The circuit breaker doesn't do anything to fix it, and furthermore... Are you kidding me? You gotta be fucking kidding me. Come on. Start. Fucking start. She comes to the terrifying realization that she is, in fact, in a horror movie. Trying to calm herself down that it's no big deal, the fallen object begins to glow, as if to say, yes, I am a big deal. So she hides back at her house, terrified. Don't worry, she might not be able to call anyone, but her husband calls her up, only to hear her talking hysterically about how something crashed from the sky, the power's out, and she is so scared. Did you call the police? I couldn't. My phone wasn't working until you called me. Call them, and whatever you do, stay in the house. <laughs> I'll just assume the phone not working is a euphemism for you not knowing to call because I didn't tell you yet. And if that doesn't work, just drive into town. You can stay at the red line until the power comes back on. I can't, the car's dead. What do you mean the car's dead? <laughs> Don't give me that, just try harder. Man, it's gotta be real fun when the slasher villain jumps her and rips her heart out of her chest only for him to look at her and be like, pfft, get up. Right on cue, the phone dies again. And she is sure there is someone in the house with her. Someone. Or. Something. <laughs> Introducing a freaky deaky alien, played by Brandon de Spain. And <laughs> what a relief. I was really concerned for a second there that the monster in this movie might actually be scary. To be fair, despite this getup not being the most visually terrifying design, I really have to give the actor credit for making something out of nothing here. The suit is basic, the gray alien mask is an interesting twist on a cliché, but the way De Spain moves in it makes this section of the movie. They could just walk around all human-like, but no, everything they do is odd, strange, and for lack of a better word, alien. She manages to slip away, which is... Pretty much the entirety of the horror in this segment. The creepy alien stalks around her empty house while she hides from it, unable to escape, and not even able to call for help thanks to her phone not working! <laughs> Until it suddenly works again at the worst possible time! Well, I guess a minute before or a minute after really wouldn't have made that much difference there. So she is attacked once more, unable to escape her extraterrestrial abduction and probing specialist, with her useless husband on the phone, confused and stupid as always. <laughs> ah, see? This story did involve Art the Clown. There he is, right there. Turns out, all this time, her husband did the art for the DVD cover of this movie. Why am I watching it? Internet film reviewer here, it's not about the quality of the movie, it's about how many expletives you can string together while describing it. Hmm, that's funny. Usually the monster from the VHS cassette has to come through the TV screen first. She assumes it's the kids messing around, but they insist they've just been in bed. Also, she just learned that Tia is in here because she's spooked too. Now your parents are going to be home any minute. I want the both of you to go to bed. Maybe we could if you'd stop checking in on us every five minutes. What are you talking about? But as it turns out, she's not the only one seeing and hearing strange things around the house. Which means either there is a spooky supernatural horror out to get them, or the creaky old house noises have really stepped up their game. Still no reason to check those corners or perhaps get something for self-defense, no. There's only one thing to do when your anxiety is at a fever pitch and your sense of self-preservation kicks in. Ugh, this is ridiculous. I can't convince a little girl not to be scared and I can't even convince myself. Just watch more scary movies! Hey, whatever doesn't kill you can only make you stronger. Cinema makes me stronger, doesn't it? Either way, this brings us to the final tale in our horror anthology. 
Terrifier. That is the original Terrifier short, not the feature film made some years after this. This particular flick is a more grindhouse-style presentation, with heavy use of warm colors and a downright oppressive film grain effect throughout. We are introduced to our protagonist for this story, played by Marie Mazur. She's running low, so stops at an all-night gas station in the middle of nowhere! And when you say it like that, it sounds like a bad decision a horror movie character would make, but... But what the fuck else are you supposed to do when your gas tank says he? It appears the proprietor of this service station was preoccupied with the antics of a deranged clown. Seriously, you think this is funny? You think you just piss all over the place and smear your shit on the walls? Of course. It's art. The attendant, played by Michael Camille, tells the clown in no uncertain terms to GTFO, and he eventually leaves, allowing the woman to finally get her gas. Seems she's trying to head to the interstate to get back up to New York after working on her latest movie. Is there anything I would have seen you in? Uh, I'm not an actress. I'm a costume designer. <laughs> well, then I shouldn't be too surprised by your current deer-in-headlight style of acting so far. However, before he can finish giving her directions, a strange noise arrests his attention. This obviously requires investigation. Investigation that seems to take a damn long time, so eventually she has to go up and check on him. Whew. Either she is very patient or Art is really efficient with a hacksaw. As the clown cuts off the man's head, she flees for her life! Actually starting her car and driving away as fast as she can and calling for help! your car starting was enough of a miracle. Let's not expect the phones to actually work. Also, it's a supernatural evil as Art appears ahead of where she was going. So nothing to do but swerve to avoid an accident, then just stop dead and be all like, nah, this, this isn't real. I should just calm down. That'll stop the homicidal clown. Let's be honest, he doesn't need supernatural slasher teleportation powers at that point. She gave him plenty of time to catch up. Now she might have that full tank of gas in that working car, but... Ah, it's so much better of an idea to just stop by the guy with their emergency lights on. That'll help. <laughs> or, get this, they were in need of help. Hence the emergency lights. Getting back in her car and fleeing the scene, she calls home, but her phone dies. So that's that. <sighs> that's what I like in a good psycho killer. Variety! She bests the saran wrap and runs for her life! Into the woods and a handy dandy abandoned shack, as you do. Barring herself inside, she finally is safe from the clutches of the killer clown. Except, of course, you have to remember, clowns aren't above using Looney Tunes' methods of infiltration. And Art captures her! And boy oh boy is this some straight up torture right here. Until she stabs him in the eye! And the back! Giving her yet another chance to flee into the night! Into the car of a random passerby! Hey, are, are you okay? Oh yeah, sure, she just partied really fucking hard this Friday night. She tries to tell him about the whole killer clown problem she's having, but he's skeptical. Now, well, just need a little proof is all. Ah, uh, yes, the, the classic clown technique of 9mm. The car spins out of control and crashes! By the time she comes to, she is in the lair of the clown. And <laughs> I, 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 I cannot, cannot show that. Where are my dolls? Thus, the horror anthology comes to an end, but the story isn't quite over. Hello? Yes! Please! Yes, help me! There's been a murder! Oh god, this is like the seven days, except it's seven seconds and they've already happened! As such, the TV turns back on and Art the Clown arrives to demonstrate that the show is not over! Well, hell, if I'm ever going to use this clip, it's got to be here. Quick! 
Change the channel! Then she sees herself and Art on the TV in their living room, but he's not there in reality, but he's there on TV, and she definitely removes the VHS, destroying it! Timmy's probably not going to be happy to hear about that. Oh my god. Nah, don't worry, it's probably some bullshit. Everything is fine ending with the kids pulling each other's hair or something. <laughs> Just your imagination, been watching too many horror movies. Okay, no, 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 never mind. They're, they're, they're fucking dead. So, um, uh, anyway, <laughs> that was All Hallows Eve. Pretty nice. Generally, I don't care quite as much for horror anthology movies, as instead of one great story, or potentially great anyway, we get three smaller tales that, while possible to be very interesting in their own right, can only do so much in the 20 or so minutes they get to do it. All Hallows' Eve does it well in that the stories themselves do hold up, for the most part. Uh, the middle tale of an alien home invasion is by far the weakest of the three, but that's not to say it's without its charm. The sense of tension is very high throughout, and it really didn't need a whole ton of depth in order to be properly horrifying. The opening and closing stories feel like they fit the whole thing a lot more thematically, however. And, of course, the manner in which a horror anthology is held together can help make it greater than the sum of its parts. In that sense, All Hallows' Eve does... Something. The big story about the haunted videotape works-ish, not really something we haven't seen before, and the sacrifices made to the tales are evident. Hard to say the stories flow just as well when a good few scenes are interspliced with shots of people watching a movie. Really, uh, really getting me into the story there. But of course you know that I love me a horror story with a tragic ending, and boy howdy does this have that. Not one, not two, not three, but four bad fucking endings. More than that, I might start thinking it's a bit much. Might. But yeah, this is a horror because there are horrifying situations that the characters can, and will, not make it out of. At the end of the day, All Hallows' Eve is a well-done, varied work of horror. It's got its shortcomings, and I will always believe that the middle tale could have been just about anything else, and it wouldn't really affect the story all that much at all, but the overall package is still very worth checking out for fans of the genre, or general moviegoers that want to know what all this hubbub about people dying in horrible ways is all about. Coming in at four, chunks of former friend out of five. It's probably not going to make anyone's best of lists, but that's not to say it doesn't have a delicious sense of dread throughout. Thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, not every clown is evil. That still doesn't mean you should let your guard down. Oh, Sarah. Yeah? Don't get killed. Funny.